want to um, extend a congratulations to Roman and Abigail Levi. They uh, were married last night and they are headed to, I think I'm saying right, Turks and Caicos Islands. Yeah, so um, pray for their, they'll be there for a few days enjoying their honeymoon, so um, had a great time with them last night. Also, i uh, give you an update on my dog. I think I touched a nerve because I had actually uh, more people respond to me in reference to my doggie than uh, in reference to my preaching. I don't know what to think about that. But uh, uh, he's doing, he's doing um, better. I took him to the vet on Monday, and by the grace of God, they just, um, they just brought him right in, which is unheard of with my vet. But um, they gave him a shot, and a sh- and he got control of his legs again, and he's doing much better, thinks he's a young, he still walks a little kitty wampus, but he thinks he's a young boy again, and uh, as long as I give him one shot a month and, and some hip and joint pills, I may have Toby around for a little bit longer, so that's awesome. Hopefully he outlives me, but that's great for me. Um, and then, uh, but I do have another prayer request now, I'll move from my dog to my daughter, um, they're not in the same level, but um, pray for Kristen. She's starting to get a little morning sickness happening on her here now, so uh, that's probably why she couldn't, uh, or that's why she couldn't sing this morning. So be pray for her. I got a baby on the way. So good things are happening. Next week is Father's Day. Um, invite all of you dads back here to join us next week. But um, I have the opportunity to speak into the lives of our graduates uh, today, and I'm excited. To be able to do that, this is not just a message for the graduates. Uh, it is a message that I think you will see resonates for every one of us. But uh, specifically, I want to talk uh, to our grads uh, this morning. The guides at the tourist park in the Alps say the same thing. They've seen it time and time again. The day almost always begins the same way. A few dozen tourists sign up for a day of mountain climbing. The brochure promises a experience never to be forgotten. The hike will take about eight hours up and back uh, with a lunch break, about halfway at a midway station, complete with restrooms and a cantina. The going will be tough, but it is doable for anybody in reasonably good condition. Parts are steep, but most of the trails are really just gentle switchbacks and moderate turns. Uh, Experienced guides, wide paths, and guardrails at needed points guarantee a safe return. That's what the brochure says. By the 9 o'clock departure time, about two dozen hardy climbers are on hand. The half dozen guides uh, distribute the gear, the water bottles, the backpack, sunscreen, and first aid kits. The group starts out at a rather casual pace. The younger hikers are excited and they're encouraging the guides to go a bit faster. There's a lot of talking going on and some even try to lead the group in a song or two. By the beginning of the second hour, the mood changes. With the terrain, the incline is steeper. The breathing in the thinning air becomes uh, harder and there's less talk. And all attempts at singing have been uh, uh, stopped. No one calls on the guides to pick up the pace anymore. Into the third hour, everyone's legs, except for the best condition, are starting to ache in the uphill trek. Finally, as the bend uh, in the trail, as we round that bend, uh, a beautiful mountain vista opens up to their eyes. It's the most beautiful sight they've seen, yet not as beautiful as the Midway Station, nestled on the edge of an alpine meadow. A few in the group almost always run the last half dozen or so yards. Backpacks tossed aside, water bottles open with gusto and lines form at the ladies' restroom. It's always this way, the guides say. The real story is yet to take place. After a leisurely lunch, the head guide gathers a group for a pep talk before they head out for the rest of the climb. You've done well, he tells them. I know it's been tough for some of you, but you hung in there, you stayed together, and that's good. We should make the summit in less than two hours. Two hours up and two hours back. And I guarantee you, you haven't seen anything like it all day. It makes the entire climb worth the effort. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, though. 
the next hour or so uh, uh, of the climb of the toughest part. But if you'll stay together, if you'll keep together like you did this morning, it shouldn't be any problem for you. The company policy requires me to tell you that if anyone wants to at this point, they can quit. You can stop here. Anyone any, uh, who thinks that he or she can't go on, well, you can wait here at the Midway Station and we'll be back in a few hours. There'll be plenty of water and plenty of shade and we haven't, we shouldn't be gone too long. The trip uh, back down the summit goes a lot faster than the trek up the summit and so we should be back in less than four hours. And after a brief speech, most of the climbers energetically shake their heads and, and insist there's no way that they're going to stop now. There's always a few who gaze awkwardly down at the feet that they've been rubbing ever since they arrived at the Midway Station. And then they stare back up at the trail in front of them. And after a few questions, a dozen or so decide to stay behind. You can see the relief in their faces. Uh, a few minutes later, the majority of the group heads off up the mountain. And the dozen or so who stayed behind are in remarkably good spirits and they send the rest of the climbers off with a good deal of cheer. As soon as they're by themselves, they begin laughing and joking and just uh, uh, they're just so relaxed that they didn't have to make the rest of the climb and they're so happy that they're not back on the trail. Most of them decide to lay down and rest for a while. After an hour or so, someone in the group calculates that the climbers should be, should be very, very close to the summit, and, and a few usually gather on the uphill side of the shelter, and they began to look up at the mountain. Binoculars are pulled out, and somebody spots the climbers almost at the top of the summit. The resting group passes the binoculars around and each one of them watches their friends as they reach the peak. They can barely see the hikers jumping up and down, patting each other on the back and pointing to scenes of awe and beauty off in the distance. The guides who stay behind with the resting group always tell the same story. What happens next is always the same. We'll return to the story of the mountain climbers in just a moment. But the story of these climbers has a lot to do with our Bible passage this morning. It's the story of Jesus, Jesus feeding the 5,000. I encourage you to take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 14. We're going to be in verses 15 through 32 and working through there today. That evening the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it is already getting late. Send the crowds uh, away so that they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, that isn't necessary. You feed them. But we have only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here, Jesus said. And then he told the people to sit down on the grass. And Jesus took the five loaves and two fish. He looked up towards heaven and blessed them. And then breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave the bread to the disciples who distributed it to the people. They ate as much as they wanted, and afterwards the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. About 5,000 men were fed that day, in addition to all the women and children. Immediately after this, verse 22, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross over to the other side of the lake, while he went to send people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray, and night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble, far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. And when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. And in their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once, do not be afraid. Take courage, for I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, is it you? God, is it you? Jesus, is it you? And Jesus, and he said, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Jesus said, yes, come. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong winds and the waves, he was terrified. He began to sink. 
Save me, Lord, he shouted. And Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. Oh, you have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? When he climbed back in the boat, the wind stopped, and the disciples worshipped him, saying, you indeed are really the Son of God. Now, this is a familiar story, ladies and gentlemen, to most of us here today. And when we hear it, oftentimes, our minds immediately are drawn to that fateful moment when Peter takes his eyes off of the Lord Jesus and he begins to sink, right? And there he is, he's, go he, he, he's going down and I, I, I don't know why, maybe out of disbelief that this was really happening or maybe out of fear as he's looking at the waves uh, that are coming towards him. Anybody remember the... Um, uh, the uh, tornadoes that, that, that passed through our area about three weeks ago. But I remember those. I was standing on the edge of my, my, my place there looking out over just acres and acres of farm field watching that tornado go. It was, just, it was just incredible as the tornado passed by. But maybe he looked at that and just was just scared. Don't know why. But what we do know is he took his eyes off of Jesus Christ. And in that moment that he takes his eyes off Jesus, uh, he looks away, he begins to sink. And that certainly is one of the key parts of this story. But today I want us to look at it from a slightly different angle. And we might have to do a little reading between the lines. But I believe that as you follow me and we take this dive into this passage, that you'll agree with me that this is what happened that day on the Sea of Galilee. However, before we do that, I want to set the stage for you. Let's consider the main characters in this event. The first one is Jesus Christ himself. It had been a big day for Jesus and the disciples. He had been speaking all day and large crowds had gathered to hear him. And there were thousands of people there that were there to listen to Jesus speak. But evening, as evening was approaching, the disciples told Jesus, it's getting late and we don't have enough food to feed these people. So why don't we send them away so that they can go into these towns and eat? But Jesus said, no, I don't want you to do that. We're going to feed them. You feed them. And the disciples, in astonishment and amazement at Jesus' response, return with this. But Lord, we've only, we, among us, we only have five loaves of bread and two fish. And Jesus says to them, that's good enough. Bring them to me. And he takes the five loaves and the two fish. And he blesses it. And the Bible says they distribute it all, uh, among all the people. Verse 20 is key. Everyone in the crowd ate as much as they wanted. That means if there were any people there that were ancestors of me, they had seconds. Somebody say amen. Okay? Everybody ate as much as they wanted. Not just one little... Uh, uh, so there was plenty of food there. About 5,000 men were fed that day in addition to all the women and children. Now, this is a miracle, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus fed, we don't know, theologians believe approximately ten to 15,000 people might have been fed that day from one little boy's lunch. Uh, if you imagine 5,000 men alone, uh, if there are women and children there as well, there could have easily been 10,000 people there. And after they're done eating, Jesus sent his disciples to the other side of the lake in a boat. And he stayed behind uh, to send the people home. And he goes up into the hills by himself to pray, be alone, and regroup. Now, while he was doing this, uh, we don't know everything that the disciples were doing. We know that he had sent them in a boat to the other side of the lake. We don't know what they were doing, though. They never made it there. Because part of the story says that they were caught halfway in a storm. But during their time, as Jesus is going up uh, into the hills to pray and be alone and refresh himself, maybe they just let the sails down and fished a little bit. We don't know. Maybe they just uh, rested in the boat and chilled out for a while. We do not know. But what we do know is this. About halfway across that enormous lake, a storm blew in. The winds pick up and the waves begin to thrash uh, the side of that boat, crashing uh, uh, over the boat there. And in verse 22, it says the disciples are in trouble. They're battling a storm. 
This is not just that the wind has picked up a little bit and the, and the seas are getting a little rough. The Bible says the disciples are in trouble and they are battling a storm. And about 3 o'clock in the morning, and you say 3 in the morning, uh, how are they still awake at 3 in the morning? It is because they are fighting for their lives, battling for their lives, trying to keep this boat afloat in the middle of this lake, in the middle of a storm. Uh, it is a terrible storm, and they're in trouble. And about 3 o'clock in the morning, they see this figure come towards them walking on the water, which is another miracle. I've walked across some puddles, but I've never walked across a lake. Anybody? All right? Which is a miracle. Now, mind you, these guys don't know it's Jesus at this point. And so they're scared. They're terrified. By the way, I might add, they're not guys who would normally be prone to being easily frightened. Several of them have been professional fishermen before deciding to follow Jesus. So they've been out on the water. They were tough stuff. They had seen a lot of things, but they had never seen anything like what they were witnessing now. And one of them, uh, they're seeing this figure come towards them in fear, hollers, it's a ghost. They thought maybe they were seeing a spirit. Maybe they were seeing a mirage. Maybe they were seeing something like that. They didn't know, but their fear quickly turned up to astonishment when they recognized that figure coming towards them. It's Jesus himself. Let me pause for a second to say when you hear stories like this, or maybe Jonah in the belly of a fish, when you hear stories like this, oftentimes uh, uh, we like to read those stories and, and think of them maybe as a, as a fairy tale. Some people might think, well, preacher, you don't really expect me to believe that happened, do you? I mean, that, that, that's really symbolic in the Bible, is it not? I mean, and that's a fair question, and you wouldn't be the first to ask it. Because to be honest with you, who of us have walked on water? None of us. But if you stop to think about it who, and who Jesus is and what he did during his life on earth, a miracle like this is not hard to believe, is it? Is it? I mean, whenever you read these kinds of stories, uh, your attention must always go to Jesus Christ. For the Bible is not a collection of unbelievable fables about a man named Jesus. It is the story of God, the creator of everything, who took the form of a man and lived here among us. Somebody say amen. God truly visited this planet as a human being. Would it not be reasonable and almost expected that he would be capable of feats beyond that of mere mortals? Absolutely. That's who walked on the water that day, friend. It was God in, in incarnate. It was God in the flesh. It was Jesus. The same person who healed the sick and caused the blind to see, the deaf to hear, and raised the dead. So if you struggle in believing that this story really took place, that it really happened, then the real issue here is that you have forgotten who this is, for nothing is impossible with God. And so a miracle like walking on water should not surprise us. Jesus' recorded miracles may be shocking to some, If you meet the Jesus of the Bible, he is called the master over creation. It's how he was able to calm the storm, speak to a tree and have it wither up or or come to life. It was how he was was able to tell a donkey to sit and and speak uh, uh, to a man. It was how he was able to make the sun stand still and walk on water. The Bible also calls him not just the master of creation, but the master of men, which means he's able to to calm the storms that rage within me uh, as well as the ones upon the sea. Somebody say amen. Because he is in fact The Son of God. There's something magnetic about my Jesus. There's something special about my Jesus that draws men and women to Him. They see something in His Spirit, hear something in His Word that makes them want more. He had a way, as a way of pulling the best out of people. He had a way of looking into our heart and seeing the possibility and potential that other people overlook. So He inspires in men and women a fortitude and persistence that enables us to keep going when other people or when most of us or when we might give up. People constantly receiving second chances with Jesus. He's still that way today. 
And once you begin to see him not just as some unbelievable character in a uh, spoken about only in church uh, or the author of a self-help book called The Bible or a pacifist who is always uh, 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 loving to everybody and never disturbs or challenges people to change. Once you begin to see the real Jesus of the Bible, you will under and understand the difference that he can make in your life. You will never want to be without him. There is just something magnetic about my Jesus. Somebody say amen. Amen. That's the way it was for Peter. That's the way it had been for Peter, the second character in this event. Peter was a fisherman who knew that normal people don't walk on water or calm storms. He had fished and swam in these waters many times before. He was no backwoods uh, 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 dummy who was prone to being gullible. He also knew the kind of storm that they were caught in. It was the kind that had taken lives before. And it could just as easily kill every one of them that day. If you've ever watched the movie Deadly or, or the show Deadliest Catch and those crab boats out fishing on the Bering Sea in the middle of a storm, it's not for the faint of heart. Or if you've ever watched that movie with George Clooney in it, The Perfect Storm, that's what I imagine it was actually like. They were in, the Bible says, they were in serious trouble. Strong winds had risen and the disciples were in trouble fighting heavy waves. And right in the middle of those heavy waves, right in the middle of everything that is happening, all of a sudden they see this figure walking on top of the water coming towards them and at first they're terrified and somebody goes it's a ghost it's a ghost and somebody else goes no it's it, it, it's jesus is that you jesus and jesus said it's me and when peter sees jesus coming towards him i'm assuming that he knows a miracle is happening right in front of him i suspect that peter Knew that he had been in the presence of a miracle from the very moment that he dropped his net and decided to surrender his life and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know what was going on through or going on in Peter's head that day or why he did what he did next. I doubt if Peter even knew why he did what he did. But all of a sudden, Peter's shouting, Lord, if it's really you, let me come to you on the water. I wonder if he thought, man, did I just say that? I can't believe I said that. Oops, I didn't mean that, God. You know, level below me, Peter, I often speak before I think. I think out loud and, and, and I take that back. I don't really want to get out of this boat. This boat is where it's safe and that sea is raging. I don't know if he wanted to take his words back. But if he thought about taking his words back, we'll never know because he never got a chance. Because Jesus took him up on the offer and said, come on, buddy. Come on, Peter. Come on, come to me. There probably wasn't a person on that boat at that moment that was more surprised than Peter was when Jesus said, come on. But now he's stuck. He's stuck right now. I mean, what do I do? Anybody ever been there? What do I do? What do I do in this moment? Were your kids, uh, uh, you offer to go on the zip line with your kids knowing full well that they're too scared to go on it? And then one of them says, yes, dad, I'll do it. Or you go to Cedar Point with your grandkids. And you say, well, hey, I bet, why don't we go on that sky swing? And you know everybody's scared to death. And then all of a sudden, one of them says, we'll do it. Now you got to step up and do it. I mean, what are you doing? I suspect for a second, which seemed like an eternity, Peter pondered his options. What do I do now? This is dangerous. I mean, there are some serious risks here. People have lost their lives uh, in storms like this before. I could go over the side and I could sink and I could drown in these seas. I could go over the side and I could be swept away in the waves and the ocean and the current and and it could pull me over or it could sweep away. It'd be too strong. I'd never be able to get back to the boat. Or worse yet, I might chicken out and the guys in this boat with me will never let me live it down. Peter, come on, man. You thought you could walk on water. It's one of the dumbest things I've ever heard you say. And buddy, I've heard you say some pretty dumb things. In my mind's eye, I can see him that day. There he is. As Jesus said, come to me, he steps over the edge of that boat. And he puts one foot over the edge, and then the other, accepting Jesus' call. 
And as he steps over the railing, I imagine for just a second that he probably stood there holding on to that railing. But then he took his first step away from the boat. And then another step. But then a gust of wind, hard wind, blows across his body. And he realizes where he is and what he's doing and what's happening. And he turns for a moment to look at the waves. And in the time it took him to look away, he feels himself sinking. And before he knows it, he's going down. At that moment, Jesus reaches down. And lifts him up and sets him back in the boat. It wasn't the first time, nor would it be the last time, that Jesus would have to rescue Peter like that. I suspect Peter was a little embarrassed at first. He probably was. But sitting there in the presence of the Master, the others probably didn't say much to him. The storm had now died down and Peter was probably tossed a towel to dry himself off. But, but, the, but, but the awkward grins and, and, and snickers and quiet laughter that he was seeing on the faces of his buddies uh, uh, told him the, of the ribbing that was coming later on when Jesus was out of their midst. Here's where the study gives way to speculation. I suspect the other P, uh, disciples were not nearly as hard on Peter as they'd planned to be. Because I bet the more they thought about what had just happened, the more they realized that Peter didn't look as foolish as they thought he had. So they didn't give him the ribbon that they uh, uh, had planned to give him at breakfast around the campfire that morning. As they sat around reminiscing about the night before, they listened to Peter tell his version. Sure, he had spoken before he thought. That's often what he did. And yes, he took his eyes off Jesus and started to sink in the water. And Jesus had to rescue him. But to hear Peter tell it, he walked clean across that lake. It may have been only a few steps, but he had done it and they hadn't. And for the rest of their lives, they would have to listen to Peter tell of his steps on the water. And as their laughter gave way to reflection, they soon realized It was something they would likely never get to experience for themselves. Oh, they had the same opportunity that Peter had. They did. But he stood up, spoke up, and stepped out. And they just sat there. Now while Peter will spend the rest of his life talking about his steps of faith, they will spend the rest of their life thinking about what might have been. And they will forever wonder what it felt like To walk on water. And what it was like, uh, what it would have been like if they would have taken a risk and gone for it like Peter did. Okay, let's leave our story and move back to our first one. Remember the mountain hikers? Our third set of characters in this event? The guide says it is always the same. Always. Those who stayed behind watched the others as they reached the summit. And those who go the distance are celebrating as the others are staying behind uh, and never, never to experience what those who went the distance experienced. And from this point on, there is no more joking. There's not much even going on. There's no talking going on. Sure, one or two of the more talkative people in the bunch will usually speculate how far they could see when they reach the top of the summit. But after a few dirty looks, well, then that shuts down that conversation. And the silence is heavy. It is just thickening. And even after the climbers return and the journey down the mountain commences, few in the stay behind group say much. The expression on their faces say it all. And all they can think about is what they miss. They know deep inside that they could have done it, but they chose not to. And now they will never know the feeling of standing on the summit and seeing what others the others saw. All they can do is listen to the stories and wish that they themselves had finished the climb. It is always that way, the guides say. It is always that way. The mountaintop is an experience, is a parable for your life and mine. For it illustrates four lessons that are forever worth remembering as those of you who are graduating embark on a new chapter of your life or those of you who are living the rest of yours are living the rest of your life. They apply to both of us. The first one is this. 
Some of the best experiences in life require hard times and perseverance. Somebody say amen. Okay. That's a good word. Never forget that. Do not lose sight of that. In order to see the view from the summit, you have to be willing to climb the mountain, my friends. A lot of people look at the mountains in their paths, and when they see them, they think those things are barriers. But I challenge you this morning as you set out on this new journey, or as you begin again, or as you continue to live your life, uh, uh, that when mountains uh, show up in front of you, when mountains are in front of you, instead of looking at them as barriers, see them as opportunities, realizing that if we always take the path of least resistance in life, the easy way out, we will forever wonder what might have been. The second lesson is as important as the first. The only difference between drudgery and joy is often the difference between persistence and quitting too soon. Those who stayed behind at the rest station that day, they did most of the work. They sweat, they worked, they struggled, they had blisters on their feet, they were tired, they did most of the work that day, but they received little of the benefit. The real joy came at the top of the mountain. Far too many of us today, far too many people in general, put themselves in situations where we are guaranteed not to fail. We strive today as a culture, almost like never before, to never fall so that we will never fail. But maybe the reason we seldom fail, especially in the really important matters of life, is because we quit before we fall. We quit way too soon, thinking that quitting prevents us from falling only too late to realize uh, that it also keeps us from succeeding. Young people, you are being turned out into a world and a society that is risk-averse, that worships uh, sex, Money, power, entertainment, and most importantly, comfort. In America, we pass new laws every day to protect ourselves from any kind of risk. Uh, 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 don't chew on that plug that you just put in the wall. Oh, really? Come on now. Right? we got to put it all over our cardboard packages. We pass laws all the time to protect ourselves from any kind of risk. But know this, the abundant and exciting life that you seek cannot and never has been risk-free, nor is it easy. True success comes not from failing to take risks or steering away from mountains or from the tough challenges, but in persisting through them and failing to give up. Somebody say amen amen when you learn that lesson you'll learn to see your mountains not as barriers but as opportunities and you'll strive for the summer you will experience things that you otherwise would not here's a third lesson I want you to hold on to there's something much worse than failing in life it is quitting when you could have reached the summit. And then having to live now forever with what might have been. Living with what could have been is always much worse uh, than failing to even try. There's one more lesson, and it's not one from the mountaintop. But it is one that is central to our Bible story. And here it is. The safest place in all the world is in the center of God's will for your life, wherever and doing whatever that may be. Amen? Which also means that the most dangerous place that you can possibly be in your life is any place other than God's will for your life. There's no doubt in my mind that Peter could have drowned. He could have. He was caught in waters and in seas that have killed other men. He could have died that day. He could have, but God didn't let him drown. Peter could have been swept away, stepped over the side and swept away, but God did not let him get swept away. 
I'm telling you, friend, there's a t-shirt that I almost got the other day. And here's what it said on the front. I think I'm going to buy it. It said, yeah, but did you die? Yeah, but did you die? Oh, that hurt so bad. Yeah, but did you die? Oh, my muscles hurt. I ran a marathon. Yeah, but did you die? Come on now. Peter could have drowned, but he didn't. He could have been swept away, but he was not. Peter was going down. He might have fallen down, but he didn't hit rock bottom. Somebody say amen. God never let him hit the bottom. And why? I'll tell you why. Here it is. It's because Peter grabbed for Jesus and Jesus grabbed for Peter and they both held on. Friend, the safest place in all the world is at the center of God's will for your life and holding on to Jesus. Somebody give him praise. Amen. As you move out into the next stage of your life, You're experiencing today one of the mountaintop experiences in life. I can't even remember my high school graduation, but it was a mountaintop when I was there. (laughs) You're experiencing to us as human beings what is one of the most uh, memorable moments in life, graduating high school. This is a special moment in life. Some of you are headed to college locally. Some of you might be going a few hours away. Some of you might, uh, some of you might plan to skip college and try a trade and, or, or, or do something here and just get a job. Who knows? You might wind up being called into the ministry and one of you become a preacher someday. Glory to God. Amen. Others of you might be sitting here thinking, I don't even have, I don't have a clue what I'm going to do next. And that's okay. It truly is. My advice to you in life is this, don't blink and enjoy the journey. Enjoy the journey because before you know it, you'll be married with children or grandchildren regardless of whether your plans end in an exclamation point or a question mark. All of you are wondering about your future. Over the next three to five years, uh, you will make decisions that will impact the rest of your life. Some of you, uh, after 50 years, are are making more decisions that will impact your life. I want to say this to you who are graduating, all of us. Look at decisions as opportunities. Choices are always opportunities. Opportunities to take the easy way out and follow the path of least resistance. Opportunities to play it safe so that we will not fall, so that we will not fail. Or you can take risks and embrace the challenges that lie ahead and climb to the summit. There will be those in your life, all throughout your life, who will have an opinion as to how you should live your life. The decision in the end will be yours and yours to make. You can take a path that requires little effort and promises a life without risk. And it is a path that a lot of people decide or or, or desire to take today. Or you can dare to dream big and seek things that require your best. And embrace opportunities when they're put in front of you that stretch you and challenge you at every step of the journey. And let's be honest. If you take that second route, you could fail. Peter could have failed. You could fail. There are no guarantees in life, but there is something much worse than trying and failing. It's failing to even give it a shot. It's failing to even try and spending the rest of your life wondering, what if, what if? Right now you're standing at the crossroads, a crossroads of life. It's as if you're in a boat in the middle of the lake and Jesus is saying, come on. It's if you're at a midway station in the middle of the hike. And the guide is saying, you can continue on this journey and make it to the summit. Or you can stay behind. It's your call. As we wrap this up and the band comes, uh, I want to look at today as if it's the first day of the rest of your life. Because the truth of the matter is, it is. It is. Do I play it safe? Do I take it easy? Or do I dare to dream? Do I settle for less and stay behind and watch others uh, 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 make something of themselves, whatever that is? Or do I reach for the summit? You can sit in the boat or you can get out.
Get your feet wet and step out. It's your call. No matter where you're at in your life, the choice is yours. And I encourage you to live your life in the center of God's will, wherever and whatever that may be for you, and live life to its fullest. And all God's people said, amen. Bow your heads in prayer, my friends. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege and opportunity we have uh, to be here today. And Father, I pray that you would just bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to do something special before we have the band sing. I'm going to have all of my graduates and my graduates.